Peace and blessings, brothers and sisters. I'm so happy to be with you today to bring you another lesson. Before we start our lesson, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day, Lord. Thank you for the breath you have given us. Thank you for the breath you put in our lungs. Thank you for sending your dear son, Jesus, to die for us. What, a, what more of a friend could we have than Jesus? He gives us comfort, Lord. Thank you for that. He's there for us. But still be sinners to lift us up. When we look upon him, Lord, he has his hands stretched out toward us. He makes intercession toward us. We can know his infirmities and thank you for his protection. Please be with the listeners today, Lord. Help them to get a blessing out of this lesson. Help them give them courage trust in you and your word, and give them strength in you. In these things I pray, in your most holy name. With that, brothers and sisters, let's get into this lesson. I didn't make slides for this one. I figured um, I'm going to make it with uh, with the PDF that I wrote with uh, my transcript. Um, it's it's not so pretty with all the pictures, but I, I, I'm i wondering if you guys might like this format better. You can actually see what I wrote. And um, yeah, you, some people are more visual. Some people can uh, get more understanding out of reading a text. So. Um, this is how I'm going to share it today. So let's uh, let's start with the lesson here. The sources of Christian courage. And this is on my series, A Call to Courage. This is part three. The Christian's Call to Service. This is from uh, excerpts or, and paraphrase extra verses and commentary are from The Christian in Complete Armor by William Gurnall from volume one, page 29 through 33. And it starts as this. These are our directives issued. Just like the soldier is called to a life of active duty, so is the Christian. This very calling rules out a life of ease. You think you can just be a part-time soldier? Consider your calling carefully. Your spirit, your spiritual orders are rigorous. So, in the Word of God, I'm going to take a pause here from the reading. Um, I believe that our bodies don't get a rest, but our souls get a rest in Jesus Christ. He is our rest for our souls. Our bodies are to be in service of Him and and to do His will. All right, let us continue. And Jesus told his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We must deny our flesh and live in his Holy Spirit, or we are not worthy of him. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10:38. Paul had this to say to the Romans about his service for Christ. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, how often I plan to come to you, but I have been prevented from visiting you until now, in order that I might have harvest among you, just as I've had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both the wise and and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first the Jew, then to the Greek. Romans 1, 13 through 16. Our obligation as disciples of Christ is to deny ourselves and to serve others. So we're to make God first and love our neighbor as ourself, bringing the gospel to the lost and strengthening those that are in the faith. 
Jesus is our example, and our hearts need to be in sync with him, not on the teachers of our day. The religious leaders of Jesus' time questioned his disciples about eating with sinners. Jesus, knowing their hearts were far from God, this is what he called them. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the heart of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus brought the gospel to sinners. He is the great physician. As his followers, we are to do the same like his disciples. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collector and the sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners, to repentance. So, take heart, sinner. We, he has a heart for us. He loves us so much. And um, he's always there to, to, to bring us out of the darkness if we just call upon him and repent. It, it's, this is just a side note I put in here. A lot of people will say um, being around sinners is joining them. So I had to, to, to note this in here. Eating with sinners is not joining them in sin. It's sharing God's blessings with them and witnessing to them of his salvation. So it would be different if Jesus went into a tavern and, and he did not do that. He didn't witness in taverns because that was the place where they were sinning or wherever the places of ill repute. He ate with them in common areas and, and spoke with them there and um, tried to call them to him. And he does that now too through his witnesses the saints that are left over that follow his word and his will it is not the healthy you need a doctor but the sick go and learn what this means i desire mercy not sacrifice for i have come i have not come to call the righteous but the sinners so he's saying here i'm more pleased with acts of benevolence and kindness than with external compliance with religious duties so when you're just trying to serve yourself and be perfect in yourself, it's just, it can be, it's, it's, it's okay to follow the will of God and, and try to be perfect, but he's more satisfied with mercy upon others and with duty towards others and, and going and finding the lost sheep that are out there. Um, that was the first thing Jesus said when he was resurrected is to, to go and save the lost and the first of the jews and then the gentiles that's our calling at another occasion when the pharisees sat with jesus they also complained that he ate with sinners and the pharisees and scribe, scribes complaining saying this man receives sinners and eats with them then jesus compared those sinners with the law with the, to lost sheep with this parable when a man among you, if he is hungered, if he had a hundred sheep and loses one of them, does not he leave, does not leave the ninety nine in in the pasture and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? So we're supposed to look after for the lost. The ones that are saved don't need to be looked after, but we should be always trying to to witness to the lost and have a heart for them, like Jesus had a heart for them. Because his heart should be our heart. We as professing followers of our risen Savior must emulate him and deny ourselves and seek to save the lost. Also bring light to those who know the Lord and have fallen into false doctrines and those who never knew the Lord to bring them into the light. In order to reach others, we must first reach ourselves. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? but fail to notice the beam in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye while there's still a beam in your own? You hypocrite, first take the beam out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And in order to do this effectively, we must follow this list of directives. 
Renounce your bosom sins. The darling sins that you have closest to your heart must be trampled underfoot. This requires great courage and resolution. Abraham was tested to the limit when he was asked to offer his son the possession he held dearest up to the Lord. Take your son, God said, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on the one of those mountains which I will show you. He was asking to do this joyfully, to give up his most prized possession. He was in danger of holding the son God gave him in more esteem than the Lord God, his God, and required him to offer him up before him in a show of faith. This is the most extreme example, and Abraham did it without complaint, because he held God above all others, and he listened to the Lord his God. This extreme example is something we should ponder. With faith and determination, we can also let go of our darling sins, laying them down on the altar and sacrificing. If we decline to do this, it will keep us from true worship in spirit and truth. The war between the flesh and the spirit rages on. And to give up some of the things that we hold dear can be hard to bear. As the battle of the flesh rages on, it won't lie so patiently on the altar like Isaac did. It will be difficult to keep our mouth shut like our master, the Lamb of God, who was brought silent to the slaughter. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears, is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Isaiah 53, 7. Our flesh will not remain silent in this work. It will roar and shriek, tearing the heart with its hideous cries. For this is what Paul said to the Romans. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. So we will fight against the flesh, but we need to try to live in the spirit and ask God to give us help and strength in these times, always being in prayer. For our trials are many, but when we call upon him, he makes them the burden light. Is it possible to express the conflict, the wrestlings, and the convulsions of the spirit of our natural state? that we have to endure before we can put our heart under submission to the Holy Spirit and to the commands of Jesus? Or who can truly unfold the cleverness with which our flesh will argue to continue therein? When the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, Satan will work against you, trying to convince you through your flesh your weakness. It's just a little one. You can spare it. Or he will bribe your soul with secret sin. Satan will sub, sub, subtly whisper, you can keep this secret and keep your good reputation too. I won't be seen in your company to bring you shame among your neighbors. You can keep me hidden in your heart, out of sight. Just let me loose sometimes every now and then so you can embrace those thoughts and affections in secret. If that doesn't work, then Satan will ask you, to delay in executing these desires. He knows delay will weaken the Holy Spirit's power of conviction, grieving him and eventually will convince you of your pardon from them. This is something in my personal experience that I know is true. I have battled things for many years living in the faith, and after a long period of time, it makes them difficult to get rid of, and it makes them stronger and harder. And you convince yourself that it's fine because you're still you're still doing okay. You, know, you get all these these whispers, and I've had them. I know um, I'm a testimony of that. The verse here I left for this, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
Ephesians 4.30. The evil spirits are known to go into the dry places. Where there is no water, there is no life. And the Holy Spirit can't reside in you if you resist and have a hard heart. Pray for a heart of flesh with spirit and truth. And with your whole heart, I would say. How often they disobeyed him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Psalm 78, 40. Do not extinguish the spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Abstain from every form of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. Strive to keep your house clean. It's where the Holy Spirit resides. If you don't want to risk ruin. Holding on to the habits of the old man will grieve the Holy Spirit and even cause worse damage if you drive him out, leaving you in worse shape than you were before. Jesus warned about this in Luke 11. When the unclean spirit comes out of a man, it passes through dry places, seeking rest, and does not find it. it then it says, I will return to the house I left. On its return, it finds the house swept and clean and put in order. It goes out and brings seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go and dwell there. And the final plight of that man is worse than the first. Don't procrastinate. Procrastination will only make it harder to break the sin. The longer you procrast prolong, the easier it is for Satan to convince you it doesn't matter and the defender of sin and death will win, and you will help him carry out your own execution. The strongest and bravest men have fallen prey to this technique of the devil and turned to putty in the enemy's hands. They return from the battle victorious, only to die slaves to sin in their own homes. This type of man is like the great Roman who as he rode triumphantly through the city, he could not take his eyes off a prostitute walking along the street. A man who conquered em empires, captured by the glance of a single woman. My son, give me your heart, and let your eyes delight in my ways. For a prostitute is a deep pit, and an adulteress is a narrow well. Like a robber, she lies in wait, and multiplies the faithless among men. Proverbs 23, 26 through 28. Number two, conform your life to Christ. We are not to be conformed with this world. The definition of conform is to bring one thing in correspondence with another. We cannot mix God with man, mammon. We are not to compromise ourselves with the corrupt customs of, of the world. You cannot array yourself in worldly apparel, cutting the coat of your goodly profession according to popular fashion. Instead, the Christian must stand fixed in his principles. This will openly show you are a citizen of heaven by clothing yourself in the garments of righteousness and truth. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. From Romans 12, 2. It will take great courage to ignore the degradation and debasement you will surely meet for nonconformality. They will do these things because they have not known the Father or me. Sad to say, there are many Christians who will not be able to stand the strains of persecution. All too often, we see Christians arrayed in the worldly apparel of pride, covering their heavenly garments of righteousness because of the fear of being ridiculed by men or offending them if they dare to confess Christ openly. Yet, no one would speak publicly about him for fear of the Jews. John 7.13 there are so many Christians that profess Christ, but in the face of persecution are ashamed of him. They lose heaven because they don't want to face the world in what the world would call 
a fool's coat. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. While some of Satan's children will mock, others will persecute the Christians unto death for not conforming to their principles and practices. This happened with, with many Christian martyrs from the, the Romans then to the Roman Catholic Church. In scripture, this trap was laid for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they would not worship the golden image Nebuchadnezzar set up. Now, if you are ready, as soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, or zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the statue I have made. But if you refuse to worship, you will be thrown at once into the blazing fiery furnace. Then what God will be able to deliver you from my hands? And God did deliver him from his, their hands. And um, yeah. In the same way, a plot was laid to trap Daniel, who walked so faultlessly that the only charge his enemy could bring against him was a single, his single-mindedness in his worship to the Lord his God. Thus, the administrators and satraps sought a charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or corruption because he was trustworthy and, not, and no negligence or corruption was found in him. Finally, these men said, we will never find any charge against Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. The only... They only ensnared him because he refused to worship man, and God protected him from the fiery furnace. Or the, actually, that was the lion's den. My mistake. If you fail to conform to your life to Christ, when the choice comes to life or death, when a Christian renounces Christ to save his life from a cruel and evil man, how many excuses will his cowardly heart invent to preserve his life? But we know this, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It is the Christian's greatest honor when all his enemies say he will not do as we do. So when we face great opposition, we must have a firm resolve in the profession of our risen Savior. who will be easily taken and fall from grace. His heart is assured he does not fear. Until he looks in the triumph of his foes. Psalms 112, 18. In God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Psalms 56, 11. Sidestep stumbling blocks. In the church, there have always been those who make serious mistakes in judgment and in conduct, laying stumbling blocks in the path of professing Christians. In judgment, pushing people away by their conduct. Therefore, let us stop judging one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Romans 14, 13. Do not judge, or you will be judged. With the same judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Matthew 7, 1 through 2. This conduct of judgment will be difficult to deal with. Don't get discouraged and know that many before you have mishandled scripture. Paul wrote letters to the churches about these matters. Some parts of his letters are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the rest of scriptures. To their own destruction. Second Peter 3.16 True believers will know what is right in the sight of the Lord and will work for unity and peace and love, I would like to conclude. Therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this ministry, we, don't, we do not lose heart. Instead, 
We have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not practice deceit, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by open proclamation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. This verse is meant for non-believers, but I believe it can be applied here. Secret and shameful ways can be applied to the conduct in laying stumbling blocks before men in judgment, pushing them away from God instead of mercy to bring them into his arms. This conduct has pushed many people away from organized religion. So in your judgment and condemnation, you're relying stumbling blocks before believers. And this is bad fruit, and they will be judged according to their works. But I tell you that man will give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Matthew 12, 36. Instead, we're to go to them in private a few times using scriptures and your fellow brethren as your means of entreaty, never talking behind backs or gossiping. So th this verse is also meant for personal sin, but I also believe it is when people fall away, you, you want to use this. If your brother sins against you, go and confront him privately. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, that so, that, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to even the church, regard him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. This is the law of love. Because as a Christian, you are called even to love your enemy, pray that they come back to the truth in faith and love. Therefore, let us stop judging one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in a brother's way. You will need holy resignation to stand up against discouragement. Many dissenters will remain in the church even after your church witnesses to them. In this case, we're to let them alone, but we're still to treat them with kindness. This is what Jesus had to say about this in his parable about the weeds. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good sow seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and slipped away. When the wheat sprouted and bore grain, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? An enemy has done this, he replied. So the servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he said, because if you pull up the weeds now, you might uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat into my barn. So in the end, that's when the Lord, our Savior, is going to make these judgments. We're not to shun people and, and kick them out of the church. This happened to so many people that I know. Um, and them totally abandoning God because of men that judge them and where to, to love them and call them out on what they're doing wrong but we're not to kick them out and shun them and to, to push them completely away from the lord because their continuing attendance to service and your prayers for them the lord can work in their hearts to bring them out of their darkness, of whatever they're under. Reserve your judgment and continue to pray for them, that your words of witness from Scripture will work in their hearts, and don't let them cast a stumbling block in front of you. Hold fast to the word of truth. Strive to be like Joshua, 
when most of the Israel Israelites revolted and in their hearts turned back to the ways of Egypt, Joshua maintained, maintained his integrity. This is what the whole congregation of the Lord says. What is this breach of faith you have committed today against the Lord God of Israel by turning away from the Lord and building for yourselves an altar that you might rebel against them in this day? Joshua declared he would not turn away from the Lord and kept his holy resolve, even if no other man would he, no even if no other man would, he would serve the Lord. Far be it from us to rebel against the Lord and turn away from him today by building an altar for burnt offerings, grain offerings, or sacrifices, other than the altar of the Lord our God, which stands before his tabernacle. Joshua 22, 29. Let us have this same resolve. Be bold in the face of opposition and humbly entreat to them to entreat to, the, to those that are lost in the church to have true faith and love with that and while keeping the faith and not stumbling ourselves. Number four, trust God in every circumstance. There are times when a saint is called to trust God, even when he doesn't feel his presence. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Who among you walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord. Let him lean on his God. Isaiah 50, 10. You may, when you encounter this trying time, draw close to the Lord because his withdrawal may be a sign that he wants you to lean on his strength and call upon him more. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call out his name in truth. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. The one who comes to me, I will never drive away. And that's a promise from Jesus, John 6, 37. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. Because even in the darkness, God is still there. We need to trust in him, faint not, and don't turn away from him, thinking he's abandoned you. He sent darkness and made it dark, and they rebelled not against his word. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall upon me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Even in the darkness, you are there. It might be night to me, but you know all, Lord. I, to trust the Lord in these dark times requires a bold step of faith. Let us follow the example of Esther. When a man planned to destroy the Jews, Esther took action. With boldness, Esther sends a message to a, a Ahareus or Xerxes, the king. With this noble resolution, if I am destroyed, then I will be destroyed. Go and assemble all the Jews can, who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I, my maidens, will fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Even when the Lord's face does not shine upon our countenance, we should strive and eat to drink nothing but the word and fast. Just that's what it means by eat nothing but the word of God and come to him with resolution, prayer, and supplication and face the king with humble boldness. Our faith needs to go even one step further. We must trust in a killing God. We must pronounce, like Job did, though he may slay me, yet I will trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. We, should, we also should take example of all the martyrs that died in defense of his word on the altar of faith. 
It takes a miss of faith to march forward, even when we feel like we've been abandoned. It may even feel like God is firing poison arrows of frowns upon our souls. This is hard work, and it will test the Christian's steadfastness. But saints, be encouraged. And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Be patient, always in prayer, for our hope is in, is in what is not seen. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patiently. Romans 8, 25. We see this kind of faith in the woman from Canaan, who caught the bullets of Christ shot at her, and with humble boldness sent them back again in her prayer. And a Canaanite woman, woman from the region came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy upon me. My daughter is miserably possessed by a demon. But Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the house of I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. But Jesus replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Oh, woman, Jesus answered. Your faith is great. Let it be done for your for you as you desire and her daughter her, her daughter was healed from that very hour so don't give up keep begging and falling at his feet and have faith have faith trust god even in your darkest hour call upon him in every circumstance number five stay on course to the end of your life the world's a stage, and your life and work will exit together. Persisting until the end can be tedious work. Like a hitchhiker in your boot or a thorn in your side, the road ahead can seem endless, and your soul may beg for an early release. Sometimes it can overwhelm you, making it hard to press on. Call upon the Lord when you are weary and burdened, for He is your strength. Come to me. All of you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. He's our comforter. He will give us rest. He knows our struggles because he was in the flesh as we. He was God in the flesh. He knows our infirmities. Seek out the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Seek the one that overcame because he knows how to help you. There are many that have joined the army of Christ and liked, and liked being a soldier for a little while, fighting in a battle or two, but after facing tribulation and persecution, soon grew weary and end up deserting. They enlisted before counting the cost. Jesus put forth this parable about the cost of discipleship in Luke 14. Which of you? Wishing to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost to see if he has the resources to complete it. Otherwise, if he lays the foundation, he is unable to finish the work. Everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This man could not finish what he started to build. Luke 14, 28-30 Some Christians that start their work for the Lord impulsively enlisting for duty. And they are easily persuaded to take up the profession of religion, but are just as easily persuaded to lay it down after hardship. Like the new moon, they shine a little in the first part of the evening, but go down before the night is over. Perseverance is hard work. If we wish to be true disciples, worshiping in spirit and truth, we must pick up our cross daily, praying always for strength to continue. Watching day and night, never laying our armor aside to indulge ourselves. 
This self-sacrifice sends many away from Christ's sorrowful. Count the cost if you do if you do sell this pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one very precious pearl, he went away and sold all that he had to buy it. Sell all you have in this world and gain Christ. Because he, this world is fleeting. We have, we're everlasting. We have everlasting souls. Our souls look out of the eyes of our flesh. Make this your resolve and your calling. Make the Christian faith your daily work without any vacations from one end of the year to the other. Seek his face always and strive to do his will. You need to pers persevere so that after you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Hebrews 10.36 That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. That's what we should live for. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. These examples here are enough to show you how much courage and determination is needed. Moses and his courage to face his past. Moses faced his insecurity and fears by responding to God's call to go back to Egypt where his fears began. He was motivated by God's vision of working through him to save his people, the Jews, from the suffering they were experiencing. But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I will surely be with you, God said, and this will be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, all of you will worship God on this mountain. Exodus 11, 3, 11 and 12. According to this Bible verse, Moses gained courage because God promised that he would be with him through his journey. In turn, Moses' bravery inspired the Jews to follow his lead through the parting of the Red Sea to escape the Egyptians. The courage of David to face impossible situations. The book of 1 Samuel chronicles the epic power struggle between the Israelites and their chief enemy at the time, the Philistines. Though King Saul and Israel soldier, Israelite soldiers were dismayed by the daily threats of their enemy's giant, David took courage to fight Goliath. He was motivated by his disdain for Goliath's defiance against God and his people. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. But Saul replied, You cannot go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are just a boy, and he has been a warrior since his youth. David added, The Lord who delivered me from the claws of the lion and the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Go, and said Saul, and may the Lord be with you. David had courage because of the countless times that God protected him from danger in his past. He had steadfast confidence that God would deliver him against opposition. Dave acted, David acted on faith to fight Goliath with a slingshot, and God gave him the victory. As a result, the whole army fought at his side and with God's help, won a great battle that day. Esther and her courage to take a big risk. And we talked a little bit about this a little earlier. Esther risked her life to persuade her husband, King Asuras, or Xerxes, to foil the plans of Haman to annihilate the Jews in their country. She was motivated by the faith taught by her uncle Mordecai, that she would be fulfilling the call to save God's people through her. Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susanna, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and all my maidens will fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. 
and if I perish, I perish. According to this passage, Esther prayed and fasted to put her trust in God to give her courage to plead with King Xerxes to protect her people. Her faithful sacrifice paved the way for the Jews in her country to stand up against attacks on them and fight back and protect one another. God brought about a great victory for them that day. Daniel, the courage he had to not give in. In Daniel chapter 6, a group of politically motivated administrators laid a trap for Daniel by manipulating the king to sign a law and a regulation that would put any death to anyone who worshipped any god than him. And we spoke about this. Daniel stood on his conviction to pray to God only. In spite of the consequences of being thrown into a den of lions as punishment, he was motivated to face this fear because he was so grateful to God for all the ways God blessed and protected his life. That gratitude made him extraordinarily confident. Now, when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went into his house where the windows of his upper room were open toward Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees, prayed and gave thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Always give thanks to the Lord for your breath. Always, brothers and sisters, and all the kindness he has bestowed upon you. Daniel's courage grew through praying three times a day, even though it was against the law. His honor of God in prayer overpowered the temptation to be afraid of people. His devotion to God inspired King Darius, a foreign king, to write to all nations in their day to fear and revere God. Then King Darius wrote to the people of every nation in the language throughout the land. May your prosperity abound. I hereby decree that in every part of my kingdom, men are to tremble in the fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion will never end. He delivers and rescues. He performs signs and wonders in heaven, in the heavens and on the earth. Where has rescued Daniel for the power from the power of the lion. So, march on, Christian soldiers, and keep the faith. Stay on course and keep your eye on the prize, eternal fellowship with our Savior. When you're weary, call upon him and have faith in his promises, always keeping them in your remembrance. Die to sin daily and pray without ceasing. Take the full armor of God so you can stand against persecution, tribulation, leaning on Jesus when we are heavy burdened. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable. Always excel in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Thank you, Lord. The next section we will focus on is the source of the saint's strength. And I want to say a, a prayer out of the deepest of my heart. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you for all the blessings you bestow upon us, Lord. Every little thing, Lord, everything we miss, your power is great, Lord. Your mercy is great, Lord. Your promises are always true, Lord, and I thank you for that. Let us always bring those promises into remembrance, Lord, that we may gain strength from you, because those promises will never fail. You will never fail, Lord. You are our strength in our high tower, so we can see many miles. You are in the valley, so when we look, we're in the valley, we can look up to you. We are made humble in the mountain as well, Lord. And we, we kneel before you. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice for us. Thank you for your intercession for us. Thank you for being there to comfort us, Lord, in our time of need. And these things I pray that you be with those. They call upon your name always. 
in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for this uh, lesson. It's been a blessing to me, and I hope it's been a blessing to you. Um, I hope you find strength in the Lord today. You uh, read his word, call to him, call upon him in every circumstance, in every case. Any time of need, he's always there for you. God bless.